Welcome to the February 10th meeting of the Franklin School Board. This meeting has been properly posted. Ms. Larson, can we have a roll call, please? Yes, Mr. Gamble. Here. Mrs. Witkowski. Here. Mr. Alexandrovich. Here. Mr. Lewis. Here. Mr. Sprague. Here. Mrs. Sapersky. Here. We are all present. Thank you. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Motion by Ms. Wachowski. Second. Second by Mr. Sprague. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Community comment period. Participants under this agenda item must limit their statements to three minutes with a maximum of 15 minutes for any and all comment. If a comment, if a community comment is related to an agenda item, the board may respond to that comment at the end of the community comment session or during the discussion of that agenda item. The board may not discuss a comment or question that does not relate to an agenda item. Per board policy admin, administrative rules 8300. Would anyone like to make a comment? Anyone like to make a comment? Then I'll close community comments. Are there any school board and, or, Announcements from the members. Okay. Moving on, school board calendar. We have a regular board of education meeting on February 24th here at the ECC at 6 p.m. A regular board meeting on March 10th here at the ECC at 6 p.m. Item 7 is our district administrator update from Dr. Miller. Good evening, everyone. Just a few items tonight. Um, today, we sent a survey to our families to help us with our planning for the 21-22 school year. Knowing that what we know about COVID and vaccinations, we are asking our families to answer two questions. The first question is, if the same virtual program as this year were offered next year with a year-long commitment, how likely would they be to enroll their child in person or in virtual learning? The second question relates to why a family would want a uh, to participate in a virtual learning program. And it includes a medical condition of the child, a medical condition of a household member in the family, general concerns about COVID, a preference for virtual learning, and other. Obtaining this feedback is important to our process of engagement and meeting the needs of our families. We will also use this information to determine our next steps. Things to consider once we have the data is the number of students and how we would offer virtual programming. We sought feedback as we developed our program in spring for this school year and used multiple surveys to do so. We will continue to engage our families in the same manner as we work through the planning for next year. We are also in the process of planning for summer school and we are planning a program to be in, in person. On March 10th, the board will see and approve the courses. We will also share at that time how we will conduct summer school while providing the necessary COVID-19 protocols. Parents will receive more information about signing up for summer school in March. And finally, next Monday is the Professional Development Day. Our focus will be on the goals of our school action plan. Tonight you'll hear from two schools about their action plans, but also we're continuing our important equity work. And one of the things that will be happening Monday is a, a number of our support staff personnel will engage of one of the two mandatory 90 minute training sessions. And if they're not attending Monday, there'll be other opportunities through the month of March. Our focus is on our data and the equity research, similar to what the board participated in in their workshop. So that's what I have for you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item eight, reports, presentations, and other school business. First off is our Friends of Franklin presentation. 
Mr. Sprague and Dr. Miller. everybody in the community. First is uh, Rachel DePiro, um, nominated by Chad Nelson. <laughs> Chad wrote, Rachel demonstrated stewardship and provided Robin Wood with a variety of beautiful maps at the start of the year that she had made herself. These were given to students who lost or forgot their maps. She also said to let other schools and the district office know. This was really helped to ensure our students had the proper PPE and safe for school. Thank you, Rachel. Sometimes it's those, those little things that just come from the heart that make a really big difference. And she just came in and um, brought us those maps. And honestly, it was wonderful because we did have kids lose them. We had kids, they would break or if they get them in the start of the year. And now they had a variety to choose from, uh, and they were able to get like the party rest, or like proud to wear the mask that we gave them after they left. So really good to be appreciated. So thank you. Can I just give you one more break? Do you want to hold that? Or, uh, we'll we can stand for a minute. <laughs> 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 Guys, you got 14 minutes left. Let's go. We <laughs> got 13 and a half minutes left. <laughs> Just 
Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, I wasn't smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I know I forgot something. I think I blinked. Well, there's a problem smiling with your eyes. Smiling. 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 Congratulations on the Friends of Franklin Award. That is definitely an honor that you guys helped and support our school district and our schools in the way you do. We appreciate it. Item B, Principal Action Plan Updates, Pleasant View Elementary and South Woodland Elementary, Dr. Beckler and Ms. Mowbray, or Dr. Mowbray. All right, thank you, first of all, for having us here tonight on this beautiful cold night <laughs> in Wisconsin. Uh, it's our pleasure to be able to come to you and share a few things that are going well for us in regard to our action plans this year and to give you an opportunity to see something in action tonight. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But again, my name is Jamie Feckler. I'm the principal at Pleasant View. I'll let Bridget introduce herself. And I'm Bridget Mowbray. I'm the principal at Southwood Glen. And we want to start out and just give you a, just a brief uh, minute overview of kind of things that are going on in our schools, talking about what we're proud of, what we're currently learning, and what our next steps are. At Southwood Glen, there's so much I'm proud of. And I think one thing that stands out above all of it is, is the teams, the teamwork and the team collaboration, uh, particularly in this year, seeing how our teams have pulled together and really supported one another to support the social emotional needs of our students and also the academic needs of our students. Um, and so that's really been a, a, a strength. Uh, seeing the student growth, kind of looking at the mid-year and seeing that we're on track to meet those end of year goals and it really is the teamwork that's contributed to that success. Something that we're learning, uh, one thing that our team is particularly proud of uh, or passionate about, I should say, is the equity work that we're doing as a district and that's something that they really enjoy digging into and, and thinking about how we can create a equitable environment for all of our students. Some of that has focused on cultural competence and identity work and supporting the social and emotional needs of our students. We'll continue that work on uh, this coming Monday. So that's some of the learning that's going on in our school. And next steps, one of the things that we're gonna be working on as we go forward is looking at some of the success that we've seen in our recent data and talking about as teams, how can we get really specific about those things that are going well and how can we name those and be sure that we continue doing that and we spread some of those great pieces. Um, so that's some work that we're gonna be starting together on um, Monday and continuing. Um, so I look forward to getting some more specifics about that. And at Pleasant View, one thing I'm proud of is our work around our student engagement goal, our first goal. We uh, administered a student engagement survey a couple times this year already and we've been able to use those results then to determine what focus groups we'd run so as a school improvement team we met together looked at those results and said well we need to ask a little bit more about these questions some high some of the high questions where students were rating very high and some of the questions that they might have been rating lower and so we took that and we determined some other questions to ask students out of grades one three and five just a small group and we found information from them that, you know, okay, we can dig a little bit further into this topic or that topic, but our school improvement team wasn't satisfied with that. And I'm glad they weren't satisfied with that because we ended up determining that it would be best to bring the data right to the classroom for the kids. And that doesn't necessarily mean sharing the high and the low questions, but it does mean asking them their feedback on, for examples, for those high or low questions. So our teachers have been doing that over the past three weeks, asking their classes that within the community circle, an opportunity to share out one-on-one uh, -on -one or within their large group or even use Post-its and share with a partner. And they're gonna be bringing that data as a next step for us to our uh, professional learning on Monday. So we're gonna take a look at what next steps we can take as a result of finding out from our kids, not just that survey, information but from them specifically in each room what they need and I think that's just a tribute to our school improvement team and and the questions the hard questions that they're asking so that we can get better so I'm really proud of their work this year and I'm excited about our next step there 
Um, as, a, as a segue here, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about rounding. This is a strategy that we use in each of our buildings, and this is around our third goal, our staff engagement goal. And what I'd like to do is just, I have a handout for you tonight to just share the why, the what, and the how of rounding. So I'm gonna pass that out. I wanna explain a little bit of that, and then we're gonna model a rounding conversation for you so you can see what it looks like in action. Because we meet with each of our staff members uh, two to three times a year, at least, with this type of conversation. So I'll explain more about it after I hand this out. So as I said before, uh, rounding is an important strategy for us in that goal three area because it helps us to recognize staff needs, uh, helps us to really show our care for staff, and then also to hear them. If they have training needs or other, other resources that we can provide them in the classroom to make, uh, to make their classroom experience better so that our kids have the best, uh, we want to be able to do that. It also gives us an opportunity to affirm the work that other people are doing so they can recognize someone that they know is, is making an impact on them. And that is sometimes the most powerful piece of this conversation. Um, so I have the why, the what, and the how listed there. The what are the questions that we ask during that time. And the how it really is just explaining that it's an opportunity for us to be listeners. And our staff wants listeners. Um, I think anyone would want that. It's an opportunity to, to really hear, hear their opinions and also clarify the priorities and the work that we're doing every day in our building. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to actually to do this rounding conversation with Bridget tonight for you so that you can get a glimpse into what this looks like. So without any further ado, we're gonna get started here. So Bridget, before we, I'm gonna make sure you can still hear me face you here. So before we get started, Bridget, I just want to ask you, uh, how are things going outside of school? Uh, no, don't talk about school stuff yet. Let's personally, how are things going for you? Oh, thanks for asking. Um, they're going well. I'm kind of unpacking and moving into our house slowly, which has taken longer than we expected. And I have a new puppy that's keeping me very busy. So <laughs> it's been very good. Um, huh. I would have to say, um, everything about coming to school has exceeded my expectations, so that's been going really well. I look forward to coming to work, and it feels very safe here, so good. I'm feeling really good about that, too. Thank you, Bridget. Is that puppy keeping you up at night, or are you doing okay? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not but, anymore. Uh, but unpacking could, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so as we will transition into some questions about work, and I want to ask you, first of all, what's working well for you right now? You know, I thought about this question when you sent it out, and so many things are working well. Um, so I'm just going to name three three of the big things. So mm -hmm. team collaboration, for sure. <coughs> I appreciate the time with my PLC. That really helps me um, refine my lessons and kind of dig into some of the work a little deeper. So I really appreciated that. Um, also, just knowing that my team always has my back. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes through in that PLC or in all the work that we do. So that's been really important this year, as it is every year. Um, I also really feel like the protocols are working well. I alluded to that a little bit before, but our, my classroom feels safe. I feel good about um, our kids being here, and, and they have really exceeded my expectations as far as their mask wearing and distancing and everything like that, which I wasn't sure what to expect with my second graders. And then I would say that, that the kids, um, they've been fantastic this year. I'm really appreciating, I think, being in person and, and being together. Um, and like I said, just following all of the protocols and expectations and really eager to learn. So it's been, a, it's, all of that is going well. Sounds good. Thanks, Bridget. I'm going to pause for just a second. Um, I'm pausing because I didn't ask you to jot something down. I want you to jot down any notes or noticings as we continue our conversation. There's a couple more questions. 
But I want you just to, again, if it's one or two things that you've noticed in our conversation, I want you just to jot that down. It can be right on that rounding sheet that I passed out to you. All right, Bridget, continuing on, do you have what you need to do your job? You know, I would say I do. Um, just one thing I would think of, and, and this is probably kind of always the case, but I could use some more books. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> we write that down. I just saw Chris. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think I'm getting, I'm getting to the point where some of my level G readers could probably use some more work, some books, and then I'm in, going into a fiction unit that I think um, I'm looking for a couple different titles to, to really engage some of our kids. So would you be able to get me some of those titles that, that you're interested yeah, in? Maybe yeah, we can too. take a look at that? Yep. Okay. Thanks, Bridget. Is there anything I can do to help you continue to perform well? Well, one thing I really appreciate is the positive post-its that you give. So um, just having the work that I'm doing be acknowledged and, and affirmed has been really, um, that's been really great. And some, I, I want you to know that that was delivered in a week where I could really hear that message or really needed to hear that message. So thank you, well-timed. Um, I appreciate the feedback as well that you give in um, the observations. And I like that you're tying it to, to my professional um, practice goals so I can kind of um, get some really targeted feedback. I'm working on student engagement. So I really appreciate that you've taken time to, to align my feedback to that PPG. Thank you, Bridget. Thanks. So as you think about um, the scope of your day, is there anyone who's been especially helpful to you that I could recognize? Okay, so everyone, really, mm -hmm. but um, and for sure my team, which I've already talked about, mm -hmm. but I would like to uh, highlight the office staff. Um, they've just really gone above and beyond this year, and um, so if you could acknowledge them and thank them for their work, always with a smile and always ready to help, so I've really appreciated that. Is there anything Specifically, I know you said they've gone above and beyond. Uh, anything specifically for any one of those members that you might highlight that I could tell them? And again, I'll share this with them either face to face or I'll send them an email. It's just a great way to affirm. You know, I think one one thing I can think of is, is a head of student who has some medical needs and they've really taken that seriously and learned the protocols. And I feel very confident um, with whomever is in the office of those three um, that they're gonna know how to meet his needs well. Thank you for sharing that. I, like I said, I'll either face-to-face -face, uh, tell them those things uh, or send them an email. And I know it puts a smile on everyone's face when they get those compliments because uh, especially in the times that we are right now with the pandemic going on and just difficult times, it, it really helps to brighten someone's day. So thank you for that. Thank you. All right. So what I'd like you to do right now, that concludes our rounding conversation. I'd like you to, if you could pair up with the person next to you and just share uh, for a minute or two some of the things that you noticed in that conversation. It could be, uh, it could be a positive, it could be something to, to dig a little bit further into to find out more about. Uh, it could be anything that, uh, as you looked at those questions on the sheet too, that, that jumped out at you. So I'll give you a minute or two just to do that with the person next to you.
conversation some things that I heard as I was listening kind of across the room here. Um, some people said it's just a simple conversation, right, that we don't always make time for, and that's important. Um, also, someone said that positive affirmation is genuine and it's, it's not contrived. It's something that someone has thought about and responded to. And then also it's an opportunity to touch base with all staff. So it's, uh, you hit all those big points and that's, it's important for us to be able to gather this information. This is data for us. This is qualitative data and we can make decisions with that data as we look for themes across our building, as we look to meet needs of people in the moment. And it's, it's really been helpful. It's been a great strategy for both of us uh, in both of our buildings. We do this in all the buildings, all five, but um, it's, been, it's been great for me to be able to, to see into a different lens of our staff and help to really help our culture to thrive in each of our buildings. So I'll pass it off to Bridget as we close here. Yes, just in closing, we wanted to um, thank you again for the opportunity to share this with you and, and ask if there are any questions that you have of us. So is it scheduled or is it more drop-in? It is scheduled. So <clears throat> there are 10 to 15 minute conversations that are um, scheduled. How often? So I try to do five to seven a week. What do you do, Jamie? Yeah, I mean, I shoot for five to seven a week, but if we're looking at quarterly, I've done two rounds right now of all of our staff, about 70 people, um, twice this year. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm looking to do another two more uh, two more rounds of rounding. The the expectation in the system was for each site to do it once, one every employee once in first semester, once in second semester. Some of them have done more, but that was the expectation for this school year. Next school year, we'd move to quarterly. Is this our first year of implementation of rounding, or did we do it before? We so did. We'll, oh, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead. We did some some last year. So last year we picked a group to um, do. We didn't do it in the, with the entire staff. So we picked a, an employee group to um, round with. I guess. Do you get themes across buildings or grades or? Yeah, you may get themes across the building. It could be grade levels. Uh, it's also important for me when I look at our staff engagement survey results. It's important to take a look at what's coming out there so that I may probe a little bit deeper in some of those questions. Just like I said earlier, when we ask kids to give examples of questions, we can do the same thing with our staff. And it's an opportunity and a safe way to do that one-on-one. -on -one. You're not in front of a big group of people. And you know, I've, I've been able to find out some information um, that's been really helpful in regard to our building that I would not have been able to find out had I not asked it in a rounding conversation. And there's no evaluation going on, so it's just checking. No, in. no evaluation. No. It's very effective. We used to use something like this. Uh, we called it management by walking around. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a little different because you have many more individuals to touch, right. whereas our supervisors had a dozen to 15. So it, it's much more time consuming for one individual to touch that many employees. but. Like you said, you find out things that you would never know otherwise. Yeah. Ultimately, ultimately, it's about building relationships with people. And you know, you notice, and some of you noticed this, I didn't put this on that, on that sheet, but you're building rapport right away when you're asking about outside of work, what, you know, what's, what's going on. And you think it's so simple, you know, like, but we don't do it often enough. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to make that connection, a deeper connection with someone. Anyone else? No? Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks very much. Next is our audit report from Mr. Milsner. Yes, tonight we have the 2019-20 audit report. And uh, with us is Mr. Brian Mechnick, a partner from Riley, Penner, and Benton. And he will be going over the audit. We also have Michelle Olszewski, our comptroller, uh, who works on the audit very closely. All right, thanks, Jim. Um, I'm gonna first go through the um, audit and then we have a management letter, just kind of touch on that. Um, so the financial statements are presented fairly in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. 
So it's an unmodified opinion, it's a clean opinion, it's what you're looking for. Um, we had no problems that were encountered um, during the audit. We had full cooperation with staff. Um, it was kind of a unique year for, for auditing, uh, but everything went really smooth, so we'd like to thank you for that. Um, and then kind of I'm just gonna kind of go through what's all included in the audit report and then highlight some of the numbers. So um, we have our independent auditors report. Um, that's the first two pages of the audit. And then we have the management discussion analysis. Um, that's an analysis that's required in accordance with governmental accounting standards. So um, you guys put that um, part of the audit report together. Um, and then we have the basic financial statements. This shows the governmental activities, um, the governmental funds. And then you also see that there's the private purpose trust that's part of the statement of fiduciary net position changes and um, net position. And this will be the last year that schedule is included because we adopted GASB 84 this year, um, which we moved that to um, the um, regular fund, um, fund 21. And then also the student activity funds were moved to fund 21 this year. So you'll no longer see it. that schedule is not included this year as it has been in the past. Um, and that, re that caused a an adjustment to our beginning fund balance of 136725 um, to adopt that accounting standard. So um, then we have the required supplementary information. This shows our budgetary comparisons for the general fund and the special education. And then we have our required disclosures for governmental accounting standards for the WRS, the pension liability, and the OPEB liability. And then we have the other supplementary information. Um, these are requirements that we're required to have this information. Um, big items are the schedule of expenditure of state awards and federal awards. And then we also have our, our federal uniform guidance audit and our state single audit. Um, and those reports are clean. There were no findings to report on that. So um, great audit report. Um, some of the highlights, um, you had a general fund operating results. You had an increase in the fund balance of 1,431,000. Your general fund fund balances at the end of the year, um, 492,000 is restricted or for due to prepaid expenses. Um, then 900 or $6,996 is restricted um, for the unspent library funds. And then we have unassigned fund balance of 23 million, um, which is 37% of your um, fund balance or your uh, budget expenditures. Um, then we have our expenditures. Um, you budgeted 62 million, 127. Actual expenditures were 58 million, 422. So you spent 94% of your budget. And um, usually you're close to 100%. Um, this is very common this year with COVID. Um, a lot of districts did not have expenses for conferences and so forth, and just not having the students in classrooms. Um, so that's common with a lot of schools this year. So. Um, then we have revenues. You budgeted 62 million. Um, actual was um, 61 million 800 thousand. So you received 99.56 percent of your budget revenue. So and that's pretty much consistent with all the other schools that we've audited as well. So um, then we have our debt activity. Um, you had payments on geo debt um, or bonds of 2 million 665 thousand, um, and your interest expenses were 2 million 140 thousand. Um, <laughs> then we have the other post-employment benefits. Um, we show the net OPEB um, liability this year is at 5,937, which was down from 6,772 the year before. Um, and then we have our supplemental pension liability. The net liability um, was at 8,498, um, which was up a little from 8,189. 8, and then <clears throat> all this information for the OPEB and the supplemental pension comes from the actuary. So it all depends on their calculations. Um, they changed the, um, in order to be in compliance with GASB 75, they changed the um, discount rate. It decreased from 3.75% this year to 3.5. And last year it went from 3.5 to 3.75 the year before that. So they kind of went back. But that's all based off of GASB and how they adopt or calculate those. So. And then we have the net pension asset um, of 991,000. Um, this is for the Wisconsin retirement system um, compared to 1,251 the year before. So um, that is also based off of the actual report that the, um, the state has for the Wisconsin retirement system. So 
And I said there were no um, single audit findings. Um, is there any question on any part of the audit report? Yes. So you mentioned that our fund balance is 37% of our expenditures. What's the, the range that you see in your audits across the state? I like to see at least 25%. Um, if any of them are under 20%, um, those are the districts that have to do a lot of short-term borrowing. Um, so the higher you are, the less short-term borrowing you're going to have to do. Um, and we did see these numbers increase this year due to COVID uh, because they didn't spend as much as they, they were in the past. Um, so that has increased the fund balances. Um, I'm assuming that those will probably change. Um, who knows? But um, going forward, once the schools are operating at full capacity again. And is this net of fund uh, the capital fund? Is this, this is not including the capital fund? No, nope, this is just the, the regular fund. fund. Um, it does not include any of the, the GASB adjustments we make for the pension or the um, OPEB or, or the WRS. So 37%, and Correct. you typically see 25 Correct. Okay, thank you. <coughs> um, also, um, with, this, with the state budget and everything happening, there was some discussion about the perception that school districts do are sitting on all this money because of COVID. So what, what, maybe you're not the person to ask, but what do you think a year from now, what are we going to be hearing? This is really great news, but what do you... <laughs> That is such a hard question to answer because because we don't know what's going on. It changes from day to day because um, the federal government keeps on putting more federal funds that you're receiving um, to, to help with um, education and so forth, um, especially with the food service program they've received. Um, that was pretty much one of the major programs we almost tested at every mm -hmm. single school because they received so much in federal funding for the food service program. So it's so hard to tell what's going to happen in the next year um, once hopefully everything will be back to normal within a year but nobody knows okay thank you yep any other questions I guess one other thing so generally there's a lot of OPEB stuff here and stuff and correct actuary and all that so is are we okay or is it going the right direction or the the OPEB yes um, you kind of watch what your benefits are um, because the OPEB probably has only been around for the last, uh, I would say, probably eight year, eight to ten years. Um, and when they first started these, the actual reports and they saw what their liabilities were, a lot of districts changed the benefits for retirement. Um, and that kind of, really, we started seeing those numbers decrease. Um, and the majority of districts that I worked with, these numbers were a lot higher ten years ago when they first started. So. I think it was it was actually a good thing that they came up with these requirements that you have to disclose this in the audit report. Um, so yeah, you're kind of right in line with with other districts. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? All right. We also issue a management letter, um, and this is where we report any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. Um, and you have the same significant efficiency that you have every year for the preparation of the financial statements. Um, pretty much the only thing that we're responsible for in the audit report is the independent auditor's report. Um, you're required to do the financial statements based from the fund statements and then change them over to the governmental activities. Um, so that's a, making adjustments for all the capital assets historically and for the current year, um, all your debt and then recording all the OPEB activity, and then footnote disclosures for all that too and the required supplementary information. So I would say for um, our 35 districts that we audit, we probably have one or two districts that we do not give that to because um, their um, comptroller or business manager um, used to be an auditor, so they kind of know what they're doing. So not that you don't, you guys do <laughs> a, an amazing, you guys do an actually an amazing job. So uh, I'm not saying that. But it's part of our standards that we have to look to see if you're able to actually do all the footnote disclosures and everything. So, um, and then if we have another comment about the actuarial that um, you need a full um, actuarial um, calculation for this coming year. So I'm assuming you guys have started that already. Um, so, and then if we would have any disagreements with management um, or if we did um, proposed audit adjustments or there were any material ones, 
Um, if we proposed them and you didn't make them, we would disclose that, or if there were material ones, we would have them attached to this letter as well. And I'm happy to report, I think there was one journal entry that you gave us, um, so otherwise there were no audit adjustments, which is very unusual for, for auditing school districts, so good job. So that's all I had. Any other questions? Owen? I just have one more. Okay. So um, and I, I, it relates to a, a note on cash balance, because we have a lot of cash. Yes. And something about not having a policy on cash management. Or There's some statement here about to that effect, that we don't have a policy on. On the. Um, cash management. Uh, or on the policy of custodial risk. Yeah. So that's like if you're, um, you guys have some that's unsecured, uninsured, up to $5 million. Um, so some districts have a policy where they say that anything um, that's not uninsured, they get a, a collateral agreement with a bank, and they usually pay money for that. Um, so some districts, I have very few that actually have an actual policy um, for that. So that's really nothing I would be too concerned about. How much is on collateral? Um, Five million four hundred thirteen thousand. Because you did have some pledge securities, um, or that were in fully insured of thirteen million, that were collateralized by the. So you had excess above what you you had there. And what does it mean when it's uncollateralized? That means that if something happened to the financial institution that those funds are with, you would be they're not insured, so you could lose those funds. So there's and there's things we could do though to protect. Those Correct. Funds, but we're not. Correct. Okay. So, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? All right. Thank Exciting you very much. Stuff. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next is our community education and recreation. Recreation Department Aquatics Classes Discussion. Mr. Um, Anderson is here this evening to share with you a proposal <clears throat> for how the recreation program can um, provide our aquatics program in, a, more, in a, a better way to serve our community. So we thought it would be good for you to hear um, why we're considering that and obtain uh, your feedback on that. So I will turn that over to Mr. Anderson. Thank you. <clears throat> Excited to talk to you about a partnership we're working on with Innovative Health and Fitness for our Aquatics Program. Um, the reasons we looked into this partnership were listed on the uh, papers that you got. Um, really, the department with aquatics that we run right now every year is operated at a loss for aquatics. Um, lack of staff. Uh, due to COVID, due to pool renovations and fixing the pool, um, we're not able to give kids a regular schedule, um, so we lose a lot of staff turnover. Um, the temperature of the pool, um, during the swim season, that temperature is turned down to about 81 degrees. Still too hot for the swim team and too cold for us for swim lessons. Um, so when we get into the winter session, late fall, parents are not wanting to bring kids to swim lessons to take them out in the cold. Uh, the locker rooms, although they're great for high school athletics, they're really not meant for families or for people to take swim lessons or working out in. Um, so children of opposite sex, of the parent bringing them there. So if I took my daughter who was five and I wanted to change her in the men's locker room, that's a problem. And can't take her in the girls' locker room because that would be a bigger problem. <laughs> so the locker rooms don't typically work real well in Franklin at the high school. Uh, lack of time slots to run lessons. Uh, the swim team has become more and more successful, um, so the practice times have moved later and later. That pushes back our uh, start of our swim lessons to about 6.30, which again, we start with the real little ones, and that's too late to do that. Um, with Innovative Health and Fitness, uh, they've been open uh, during COVID, offering swim lessons, so they have an existing staff right now. They would like to offer um, our kids in FIA that graduate or get their certificate in lifeguarding, the opportunity to be employed. So they would come during the testing process and hire kids to work for them. <clears throat> the temperature of their pools are 88 and 93 degrees. 
to offer swimming lessons in. Uh, the locker rooms that they have, if you've been in there, they're club style locker rooms. They're the large lockers. They also have family changing rooms where parents or entire families can go on and change uh, to get ready for swim lessons. And also the time slots that they have, um, they're running year long. Um, they're gonna make that switch with the additional people that they would get from our program. So they would offer lessons like we do during the weeknights and on weekends uh, year round. The cost of the lessons, um, we just talked with them today. They're gonna be at or below uh, the cost that we would charge coming out to offer lessons again. So it would save not only our department money, but it would save the community money and lessons. It would answer those things that really as a district, we can't answer nor would we want to. We're not gonna have club style locker rooms. We're not raising the pool temperature. <coughs> Um, staffing would be a huge issue for us if we were going to try and come out in the summer and, and try and offer swim lessons this year. We've not ran lessons in two years. Um, our existing staff that we've had in the past are no longer uh, able to work for us, so we'd be starting with new lifeguards. You'd have to train them in the American Red Cross lessons, the levels, and all the skills that they would need to be able to teach that. So Innovative makes a lot of sense. Um, we partnered with them in the past when the pool's been down. They've offered swim lessons for us. So this is something that we're working on and that uh, we're very excited about moving forward with. We're interested in the board's feedback. Um, Mr. Anderson would like to move forward because we have a rec guide that needs to be published soon that would um, have this information in it. So I'm just curious what thoughts or uh, input the board uh, might have on this. If it's a money losing proposition for us every year, I see no reason why we can't go forward. And I, I'm, I go to Innovative every day, and it's a great facility. Uh, it's, yeah, the pools are great. The, the whole place is a great place. So you're losing money because of lack of numbers, or? Uh, numbers are down due to the time slots and the starting of it. Um, most places that recreation departments uh, lose money on a clock, you just don't have enough deck time. You're in school during the day, so you can't run anything, you know, up until your varsity swim teams are out of the pool area. So yeah, every year we, we operate at a loss on swim lessons. Brad, is this just swim lessons or would this be, I mean, because I don't know how many people use Innovative, but they have exercise class, aquatic exercises and all sorts of things going on. Would this be other things or just the swim lessons? We're starting with swim lessons. We've talked to them about some of the aquatic fit classes that we've offered that have been popular, about sharing the instructor with them. Um, again, we were only able to operate some of the aqua fit classes at 8, 8.30, and there's not adults or seniors who are wanting to come out at that time to take these classes because you have to wait till the swim lessons are over with. So you're right, they do offer a lot of that. I talked with Scott Cole, who's the owner, about some of the classes that we've offered that have been popular, and he's very much interested in getting the contact information to be able to do that. But we're starting right now with the just strictly the swim lesson part of it. Could they do this without that? I mean, they're an enterprise. They could offer swim lessons. I guess I'm not sure why... They do offer swim lessons right now out to the community at a premium price. So like you've seen in our guide, we've got our resident non-resident rate. They've got their innovative health rate and non-innovative health rate. What they're willing to do is to take um, anybody that would sign up through the rec department, or not sign up through, but they would use the, the guide. There's going to be a code in there, a promo code. They would get the uh, price that an innovative member would get, and then that innovative member and or anybody signing up through with that rec promo code would get an additional 10% off. Um, so they do offer lessons out that people can sign up for, but it's more money, and I don't think their reach is as far as what the rec department would be mailing this out to every mailing oh, address three yeah. times a year. Well, so we're bringing so, students so, to them. So really, this is just like a pass-through. You're just doing some administration work, and that's it. Right. We, we're not going to take their registrations. Typically, what we're going to do is we're going to tell them about the partnership in each year in our aquatic section. Mm -hmm. We're going to list the things that Innovative has with their website. The, per the person would go in to Innovative's website, put in the promo code, and sign up for their classes through Innovative. We're not going to handle money. We're not going to cut checks back and forth. Okay. So what you're saying then, just to, to kind of summarize it, we're doing some advertising. It's not going to cost us anything, and it's still going to provide the service of lessons. Correct. Okay. Are we still going to have um, the... Uh, uh, other classes that we that have been popular in the past or are we uh, will we have zero classes <coughs> for aquatics so, uh, like the um, the the for senior citizens or some of the other classes that have been you just you mentioned class other classes 
we're only going to do swim lessons, are we going to still offer the other things that we had been offering other than swim lessons? We're working on Innovative taking that over. Okay. Um, their therapy pools that they have at 93 degrees, um, that's another limiting factor. Is we Really the only time that those classes ever ran was in the summer when seniors could park up close. The water temperature wasn't as frigid to them because it's hot outside. So Innovative would look to take that over and they could <laughs> actually then uh, be able to run the classes at 93 degrees. Okay. There's parking up front. <laughs> Um, and they would take those classes over from us. And not as, and the price would be similar? Correct. Okay, and they have capacity? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I think there, if it's good for our community, yeah. that's what we need yep. to do, yeah. is what's right for the community. Mm -hmm. Is there an, is there another swim program in the business park? Some other There's private? Swimtastics. It's Swimtastics. a private, uh, like, swim academy. Yeah. yeah, so. They don't have the capacity. No, that's a relatively, oh, I've been in there too, and it's yeah. a relatively small oh, pool. okay. They do lessons and stuff like that, a lot with small kids. Okay, all right. Will you mm -hmm. still have high school kids or other people who are um, working as lifeguards? Will you have, like at the pool as it is now, um, will you still offer like open swim time for people to just come and swim laps or something after that? We, we would have to look into, would we have the staff to do that? Um, right now, the hiring of a lifeguard, what we would look to do potentially if we were gonna do some kind of a Saturday, like we used to do family flick and floats where you could come in and watch the movie and stuff like that. We would try and use the uh, lifeguards that the athletic team uses for their swim meets and do it that way with them. We probably would not have the capacity to hire our own lifeguards for you know once here, once there, because they wouldn't stay with us. There's such a shortage of lifeguards right now that without consistent hours, they're not gonna come back. So um, if we were able to tap into the uh, the athletics lifeguards that they utilize, that would be something that we could look at for open swims and doing things. Yeah, I think when we talk about public-private partnerships, this is almost perfect because we're filling a need in the community, still keeping the rec program pricing. Um, and it's going to help us avoid a fiscal loss. Correct. And it can bring, bring in possibly additional business to a local business, you know. So it's a win-win. Well, thank you for your feedback. Much appreciated. So, Mr. Anderson, you can move forward with the rec guide and mm -hmm. doing that work with Innovative. Thank you for bringing okay. that forward. Thank you. Item E, Wasby State Convention Reports. Would any of the board members like to comment about highlights of the convention? I guess I'll, go ahead. I'll start. I mean, it was different. It was virtual. Um, it was interesting that typically in January, I've gone to a number of these. It's always the worst weather of the year, like this kind of weather. This year, it was quite beautiful. So I didn't have to leave my house, but it was. Um, I thought that the uh, the format was um, the keynote speakers are definitely kind of not as spectacular as they were in the past. Other differences were, you know, there's no exhibit hall to go through, so no stuff to pick up. Uh, I did miss the student performances. They used to have really, really excellent student groups performing also at the um, the bigger sessions. So that was different. Another um, technology thing is they had these um, like speed networking where you, a session where you just kind of popped on your screen or you're in front of your screen and somebody would pop up. I'm not sure how they picked the person. It was a way to meet and talk to people at the convention. You had like three minutes to have a conversation <laughs> and they disappear and then somebody else would, would show up. Um, I did a couple of those and um, I did meet the uh, consultant that we had last time. He was he was one of the people on there. At first, I thought, oh, well, it's going to be all consultants and people like that. But there are other there were other district people that that did show up. Um, so that was interesting. Um, one district was in Arcadia, which is you know kind of north, um, right, the La Crosse area, a smaller district. It was a superintendent, and that's where um, the furniture store is. The big furniture store, um, I think I have it. Ashley. Ash, yes, is is there? 
So I didn't know that, you know. It's just, <laughs> and clearly they were going to go in person because their employer needed, you know, kids at school. So that, that was kind of a factor in their decision making. But so it was nice to check in with people around the state. Um, I, you have my report on the different sections that I that I went to. Other notable ones, I think, I'll say is um, one that surprised me was I did go to a session on the American Indian Studies, which I thought that's going to be just kind of a filler. But the guy was outstanding was and good. made right. you really think about, you know, American Indians and their history, and more importantly, you know, what it, what how do they fit in today? What is their contemporary existence like? You know, what I always think of American Indians is more of the past and the historical perspective, but they are, they are a group that's, uh, that's there and, you know, another cultural group that we need to recognize. And we have an Indian school right here in our, in our uh, community, and I know nothing really about it. It just kind of sits there by itself. So that was kind of a surprise session that I, that I went to. Um, also, um, there was a session, um, and I think a lot of districts are looking forward to COVID being over, and what did we learn, and what are we going to keep with us? So that was kind of a, a positive. You would think that it's always about uh, how bad it was and how we didn't do it, but there was, it was actually quite positive. Um, some districts, like the NIDA district, did um, kind of maybe think about they were using, they seemed to be far ahead in terms of how they were implementing technology before this even happened. So, because they already had digital snow days in the past that wasn't new to them. So they were already training their teachers and coaching their teachers to use technology in, in a different way. But they did mention that their learning management system was key in how they are able to transform some of that te technology to make it more impactful. I'm not sure what we use for our management learning system, but I think we have one. I'm interested in learning about that. And um, usually the CESAs also have some really innovative ideas. Um, the last session I went to was an open skills network for a comprehensive learner record. This was in CESA 1, which is our area, right? And the idea is to create this learner record that crosses all different learning opportunities, not just what you learn in school, but maybe in the community, so that you come out with a, a profile of skills that you have and you could take that with you after school. So those are some of the other ideas that I came across and with with the uh, convention. So I'll pass. Thank you. That was good. I thought it was really interesting. Obviously, it was my first convention, so to experience it in the virtual format, I don't, I didn't miss all the things that you missed because I wasn't <laughs> aware of it. Um, I also wasn't brave enough to try a speed networking thing that that you tried. <laughs> I stuck with just the basic um, conventions, but I I did find it really interesting. It was a lot of things to learn. Especially again, as a new board member, I just I felt like I could do eight different things a day, and there were only like four slots. So I do appreciate that because it was virtual, they have all those sessions that were all recorded, and I can go back. And so I've been trying to find the ones I didn't get to during the day um, of the convention to to go and kind of keep keep on with that learning. All my reports are there. I think I overdid it on the report, so you guys can do it. <laughs> I also want to say this was their hundred years this organization, mm -hmm. you know, and then they have to do. Yeah this you know mm -hmm. they did have a really I think a pretty neat video do you remember the, the, yeah the video looking back at a hundred years of the school convention was really like they had pictures some one of the um, members had gone back and had pictures that he knew this person mm -hmm. you know they were a teacher and they were the bus driver and it was interesting I wonder if they could make that available to people yeah, kind of watch that but it was really interesting to see it, just that progression of public education from you know, one room schoolhouses, whatever, to the, the one of the sessions was, you know, classroom of the future, which looked a lot like our middle school, but just that dynamic change of, you know, dirt roads and one room schoolhouses to <coughs> super great technology now. So um, one of the um, sessions I went to that was interesting was about um, community mm -hmm. linkages. Mm -hmm. I think, Mike, you were in that one too. Were you? I don't remember, Linda, I if you were. One. Um, it was just an interesting way to bring the community together and increase your community engagement. Um, and it was just, it was the um, Howard Swamico up by Green Bay mm -hmm. and their approach at um, having very, a very planned out, very organized way of um, connecting with very specific groups in the community on a regular basis to get their feedback and not only 
there, you know, to share what the board is doing and how that impacts the different community groups, but also then what do those community groups and different constituents um, need from the board or want from the board. It was a really, it was just kind of interesting. Um, do you want to say more about that? Yeah, I, I, um, I, was, I was watching and I thought it was really interesting as well. And then I noticed that Anne was there. Um, so we started texting each other, <laughs> saying how great it was, and and um, See, we would have gotten in trouble if we were trying to talk at the convention. But this way, we could be it's like, true. We just text <laughs> each other. Uh, it, it, it it just shows how communication, um, especially with the community, um, especially when the community is already engaged as they are right now, um, and it promotes what uh, two way communication, which I think is is really important. Um, you know, it struck me um, when Dr. Mulberry and Dr. Faulkner were here that that um, it's sort of it's sort of like a rounding relationship um, that they have with these groups. So I think that's one to check out. Um, if, um, well, and that's just your typical. You know, we're going to talk to the staff, we're going to talk to the students, we're going to talk to parents, but we're going to talk to church leaders, and we're going to talk to the local YMCA or the Boys and Girls Club or the legislative, business the business leaders, mm -hmm. and just how can we better mm -hmm. prepare students mm -hmm. to live in this global world? Mm -hmm. um, and, and how, how can, can we, we better serve the community? Yeah, and how can we partner with the groups that are already <coughs> there? Um, so it was, it, was, it was an interesting session. Um, I noticed a lot of the same things um, that these two did um, in terms of the, uh, um, the format this year. Um, Donald Driver was the was the um, keynote speaker on the first day, and in person he is he jumps off the page at you. I mean he is unbelievably charismatic, and it does not it, it's not the same watching him on a Zoom call. It's just not the same, and it's a shame because he's fantastic, but it just is not the same. Um, I didn't really miss the Expo Center. Um, yeah, I, uh, they, I have plenty of pens, um, but, uh, um, but I do like that you could see, um, you could go from one to the other, um, one session to the other, and if, if a session is not what you thought it was, Click out. You, can, you can leave immediately and go to a different one, okay. um, and you can watch, I, I think I've, I've watched parts of um, or most of 15, um, 15 different sessions. Um, and I think there's 80 of them. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty to see. Um, I, I really, the, the linkage one I thought was important. There's also, uh, there's also one by Cedarburg um, about creating a long-term master plan for <laughs> facilities that you can use, um, uh, which Linda and I were, um, were both at. Um, but a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting um, things to learn. Um, I also attended, but what I discovered is I need to leave the district to go to a conference because it's very <laughs> hard not to check your email and be distracted. So um, I did hear a few, um, of the, I did participate in a few of the sessions. One that I really thought was important was the school safety per, uh, session. A Department of Justice and the Office of School Safety focusing on reunification and just learned that if we had a crisis of some sort, they would be here. So I really wasn't aware that they dispatch or bring out people to support you. So that was really good. And I was also very interested in their statewide uh, tip app that's called uh, Speak Up. So that was informative. The other one was called Up the Crick Without a Paddle, <laughs> which is about uh, stress and the kinds of stress, both good and bad. And um, don't stop believing, loneliness and leadership. So you kind of knew where my head was at a little bit. I think the theme of the, the uh, convention was equity, of course, but um, what I wrote down here was disruption is an opportunity to innovate. Mm -hmm. So that was really a theme that came out of the convention and I think a theme that's coming out of COVID that we need to embrace. Anyone else? All right, thank you. Item F, board clerk's report. Ms. Larson. Thank you. 
Notice is hereby given that a primary election is to be held in the Franklin Public School District on Tuesday, February 16th, 2021 for the offices of school board member. Based on the results of this primary election, six candidates will be placed on the general election ballot. The general election is to be held on Tuesday, April 6, <laughs> 2021. Three school board seats will be filled for a three-year term beginning on Monday, April 26, 2021. The ballot positions for the primary, primary election are as follows. Position number one, Maksud Khan. Position number two, Anne Sapersky. Position number three, Shuchi Wadwa. Position number four, Jeffrey P. Hall. Position number five, Angela Christie. Position number six, Claude W. Lewis. And position number seven, Angela Beer. That concludes my report. Thank you. Item nine, school board liaison reports. Um, I will, oh, you want to go first? Go ahead. I did um, attend the SWSA um, meeting, I think it was this week, and we had children possible again report. And they talked about the vaccine being available or how it was going to be become available. Um, and they also said that I think they had about 95% of, of direct health care staff were getting the vaccine, but about 65% of you know, secondary health workers were not really too keen about getting the vaccine. And they kind of are, they surveyed some of the reasons that they said, and then they gave some counter facts to kind of help, you know, make sure that we are embracing this vaccine, I guess. And she was going to share, I think, those, those uh, points, those talking points. So I, I think I'll... You have those for you, right? I don't yeah, know what we're, I, I, I don't do know what you're them. seeing I mean, as far as uh, yeah. acceptance of the vaccine. It was very, very interesting. Um, Dr. Kari uh, from Children's Hospital spoke to this, and perhaps you know who that is. But um, oh, yeah, I work with her. Yeah, the, she, she went through what, you know, some of the myths might be about the vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things she addressed that I found very interesting was you know, people talk about it was um, produced too quickly. And she said that, you know, the technology isn't new, that the technology is there. And because there's a global concern, there were a lot of resources put into this. And because of the, the widespread virus, they were able to do a lot of trials very quickly. So all of that was a little bit new information to me and um, I thought very helpful. So that was one of the myths. Um, see if I can just share a couple more real quick. Um, let's see. Um, she indicated that there's no evidence that the vaccine impacts a person's DNA. Yeah, that um, was another one. Yeah. And it does not, it is not made from fetal tissue, which is another thing that people might be saying. Um, there have been over 40 million doses in the U.S. is what she reported, and 0.05% only 0.05% of those receiving the vaccine have had serious side effects. So hearing from the medical professionals, some of this information is always very helpful. So and that's what you're referring right. to. And no microchi microchips are part no, of the vaccine. No. You can't track <laughs> anybody. No microchips are part of the vaccine. Oh, yeah. so you can't I heard that too. <laughs> These are all things that they've heard. <laughs> and then um, the second part of the meeting was we had um, legislators from one side of the aisle talk about well, how they see the budget shaping up. Um, so, and the concern, as I mentioned before, is that, you know, districts, well, the perception is that teachers aren't working as hard, they're not in school, there's, you know, there's all this federal dollars out there. So we have to kind of get the story out there. Um, so there is, um, the, the group has put together um, like nine key questions and also there's a template of information that they're trying to gather so that the, they can present you know, solid information to the legislature before things get rolling. And I'll share the, uh, the slide deck so you can kind of watch for that. I don't know, Jim, if you've been part of that, but WASBO has been doing monthly meetings on topics to kind of get set for that discussion. Um, and the perception also seems to be that the state is in a good position as far as their year-end results, so they have money, but how, do, how are we going to spend it? You know, that's always, you know, what's going to happen, you know? 
the posturing that goes on. It's it's interesting discussion when you listen to them talk. Um, and notes are taken, so you can can't, again, I can share that with you. Um, also, what else can I say about that? Um, I think uh, I think the governor, even in the, in the convention we have, the governor always comes the last day. His priorities have been, you know, broadband and mental health in the schools and the third one. I don't have it right here. So, um, and the budget was successful last year because of the, the special ed change in the um, percentage. And that is something that, that people, you know, they, they listen to that. You know, they really think that special ed should be funded much greater than it is now. It's only, it's not even 30% and it's supposed to be at 60. So that's a factor that might be successful in um, the next budget round. So that's all I have to say. Read the, uh, um, flip through the slide deck when you, uh, when you get it and you'll feel more informed. Thank you. Anyone else? Yep. I had my uh, meeting with Drs. Reuter and Cohn for curriculum and assessment, um, just talking about how we did the mid-year maps as students took their map testing, getting ready for forward testing and the ACT coming up in the springtime, um, and then talked a little bit about the return of our elementary students who came back from virtual to in-person. Uh, we were able to do that without any staffing changes or anything that way. And um, I think that might have been about it. Good meeting, keeping us up to date. Thank you. Uh, we were, um, uh, uh, Ann and uh, Dr. Mueller and I were all at the um, uh, the grand opening for the uh, home um, of the construction class. Um, fantastic, beautiful home uh, was sold late last week, two weeks ago. Anyway, mm -hmm. it was sold within the last couple of weeks. Good. Um, there was uh, there was quite a few people there, um, families of the kids and. Union members, I would guess, but um, and uh, large uh, uh, from O'Brien home. So it was. Um, it's a beautiful house, um, and the, the trades are important. So, um, so great job. Very good. Yeah. Really need to see how that came from studs in the wall the last time we were there to finished product. That was pretty impressive yeah. that our students are doing that work. I was there for the earlier one. It was impressive what they were putting together. <laughs> Unfortunately, I couldn't make it for that one. Anyone else? Here. Did we meet with our legislator at that meeting? That got postponed. Oh, it did. Okay. Next week. Okay. And the next item is school and community engagement reports. Does anyone have one? Okay. Item 10, school board meeting debriefing. Does any school board member have comments? Hearing none. Item 11, future agenda items, board liaison role discussion, principal action plan update for Franklin High School, academic excellent scholarship recipient approvals, technical excellent scholarship recipient approvals, early college credit and college start now request approvals, Franklin Public Schools Equity Non-Negotiables, and our Budget Document Revisions Review. Item 12, adjournment. I'm looking for a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Motion by Ms. Wachowski. Second. Second by Mr. Sprague. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned at 713.